Okay, uh, who am I getting a good to go from? Good to go. Okay, thank you, uh, everyone, for joining uh, Minister Dix and Dr. Henry and I here today on the traditional territory of the Lekongan speaking people, the Esquimalt and Songhees First Nation. And I'm not surprising anyone by saying the past two years has been a burden on all of us, wherever we live in British Columbia, and indeed, wherever we live around the globe. But here in British Columbia, we've shown that if we work together, we can overcome adversity. And by following public health orders and advice, looking after each other, looking after our neighbors, looking after our family members, we can do just about anything, even in the face of a global pandemic. These measures that have been in place for the past number of months to address the Omicron wave have been challenging for many, many people. But our approach since day one has been to ensure that the restrictions we put in place are absolutely necessary to protect people going forward. And that remains the case today. And we've managed through this latest wave of the pandemic again by following public health orders and continuing to use tools like masks when we're indoors, safety plans at our workplace, and of course the BC vaccine card to ensure that everyone that we're interacting with has done everything that they can to protect themselves and to protect those around them. But today I'm pleased that we're in a position to say that the restrictions with respect to social gatherings and public events will be lifted effective uh, to 11.59 tomorrow. And I'll leave uh, Dr. Henry to go through the many details that are involved. Again, the balanced approach that we've taken as a government with the best public advice we can get from Dr. Henry and her team that allows us to ease these restrictions at this time and look forward to brighter days ahead so that we can get back to the things that we love, that businesses can get back to the, the hard work of uh, making a go of it in a tough time. But I also want to say that uh, Minister Ravi Kalan and I and Dr. Henry uh, briefed over 150 business leaders today. And the general sentiment is a positive one because from the beginning, we've tried to ensure that the restrictions that we bring in based on advice are as passive as possible to meet the maximum outcome, which is the well-being of our fellow citizens. Uh, we have the strongest economy in the country. We have, uh, uh, we've seen wages increase uh, year over year over the past two years, as well as ensuring that we have low unemployment and an economy that works for everyone. There are significant challenges ahead in that regard, and they're not affected at all by these decisions today. But we're going to continue working with uh, working people, with businesses and others to ensure that our economy can continue to grow and benefit all of us. What had got us here, again, is that we listened to Dr. Henry and her officials. You listened as a group, collectively, as a province, to the good advice. We wore masks when it was, safe, when it was important to do so, and we got vaccinated in record numbers. And Minister Dix can talk about the unprecedented and heroic efforts that frontline workers made to ensure that all of us could be as safe as possible by maximizing those protections through an immunization program that was unparalleled, quite frankly, across the country. And to all of those who are in our acute care system, all of those who have worked tirelessly to make sure that our supply chains remain open, the 90% of truckers that have been going back and forth within our communities and across borders to bring important and essential supplies to our front door, I thank them. And to all of you who have been patient and, and tolerant of some intolerance over the past number of weeks, I thank you as well. We can agree to disagree, but we should not be disagreeable. I believe all British Columbians have gone through tremendous times over the past two years. All of us have made sacrifices. And I believe it's that collective effort that's put us in the position today where we can relieve these restrictions and look forward to better days ahead. And with that, I want to thank again Dr. Henry for her work and allow her to finish off this presentation by giving you some of the details on the restrictions that will be lifted uh, effective at 11.59 tomorrow. Thank you very much and good afternoon. As, as we all know, COVID-19 has brought challenges to all of us um, and in British Columbia who has stepped up and done what we needed to do to protect each other, to protect ourselves, to protect our communities. And I'm trying to move this forward, but it doesn't seem to want to go yet. that one Want to help that out, Scott? <laughs> <laughs> okay, 
I will talk while the, we're doing this. Where we are today is because of what we've done in British Columbia. Over 55% of our eligible children have received their first dose. Over 90% of people have at least two doses of vaccine. And um, over 50% of, of people have got their booster dose. And that's something that we need to continue. And thankfully, we're starting to see now that transmission in our communities and the, the subsequent hospitalizations are starting to come down. We are in the place that we are, and we've made these decisions based on the best science, based on the data that we have of what's happening in British Columbia right now. And we are able to make the changes now as a result of the efforts that people throughout British Columbia have made to get vaccinated, to follow all of the public health measures, and to take steps to protect ourselves and those around us. So today we're going to continue that transition. Is there, is there some way that you guys can advance this? Ah, there we go. All right. So let's, uh, let's move on to the next slide. And it is, uh, as I said, because we did the right things for each other, and particularly because of the high rates of protection we have through immunization, that we are in the place that we are right now. And if we can move ahead. Yep. This is just some of the images. And uh, we'll go through these quickly because uh, we want to get to the meat of it. So the next couple of slides are reflections from people in our community of why and how important it was that they were able to get this protection, not only for themselves, but to look after those around them. And particularly, as we know, those who have been most differentially affected by this pandemic, including our seniors and elders. And if we go to the next slide, um, how important it has been in so many of our communities around the province that we've done this for each other, that we've worn masks when it's important, that we've stayed away when we're not feeling well, and that we've got vaccinated. So where we are right now, if we go to the next slide, is we are shifting our response to a long-term COVID-19 management strategy that's focused on those key things that keep us safe, including immunization, and focusing attention on the things that we do for ourselves based on our own risk and the risk in our community around us and the specific actions that we all need to take to protect those most at risk of severe infection. And we know that remains our elders, our seniors, people who have immune compromising conditions. But we also need to move into recovery as we're in this transition phase. We are not out of this pandemic in British Columbia, in Canada, or globally. And we know there will be continuing pressure on this virus to mutate into a new variant, a variant that may evade some of the immune uh, benefits that we have right now. But we need to continue to monitor as well the balance of our population health that the restrictions that we have in place have caused. And then we need to be ready to respond to the ongoing waves and troughs as we get through this next few months with our very high level of, of community immunity and as we move into uh, the next respiratory season in the fall. But our goals remain the same. If we go to the next slide, and that is to minimize the number of serious illness and people dying of COVID-19 and to protect our health care system and importantly, to minimize societal disruption. And we are at a place today where we can take major steps to do that. We still have important tools, and we have more and more tools now. We know that immunization makes a tremendous difference. We also have data now that tells us that that booster dose protects not only from serious illness, but it also protects us from infection. It's not 100%. But good data here that's being presented uh, even now by my colleagues at the VCCDC, Dr. Skowronski and her team, has shown that getting that booster dose gives you an effectiveness of 60% against infection with the Omicron strain. That's important. That means we'll reduce the chances of getting infected and passing it on to others. Our public health measures, some of which will continue will need to continue for the years ahead. We've learned how important it is to stay home when we're sick, to wear masks on those occasions when we're around people indoors, wear our testing strategy, physical distancing in certain situations, and it may be important to develop, uh, to keep our case and contact management systems going for the next strain of this virus that arises. 
We have all learned about infection prevention and control in healthcare in our workplaces, and we will need to continue to manage outbreaks in, high, in uh, settings of high risk of serious illness, whether it's long-term care or corrections or others. And increasingly, we have another tool of treatment that can prevent um, people who are at risk from having more serious illness. If we go to the next slide, BC is one of the most vaccinated jurisdictions in the world. And we also know from the modeling that we've done, looking at uh, the seroprevalence studies that we've been doing systematically over the last two years, that we have a very high level of population immunity right now. And that's primarily because of vaccination and a small amount from people who've had a recent infection. We do know that an infection, particularly with Omicron, can cause a varying level of immunity that may wane quite quickly over time for some people. We do know as well that if you get infected with Omicron on the top of having vaccine, that you get a very strong booster dose response from that infection and you're very unlikely to have more than a mild illness. So those are the things that put us in a place right now where we can move ahead on some of the other activities. If we go to the next slide, we can see compared to jurisdictions across Canada that we have been effective in our approach. And this is just looking at how we have managed to come through the last few weeks with our Omicron wave. We have managed to keep our hospitalizations lower so that we can spread them out and manage and not overwhelm our health care system. And that's because of the measures people have taken to, to protect themselves and others. And our deaths remain low. It is the same if we compare ourselves to other jurisdictions around the world. In the next slide, where we see as well that we've been managed um, by the work that people have done collectively. If we go to the next slide again, this is just a comparison of the data that we presented, the, our uh, modeling from the BCCDC modeling group that we presented on January 14th when we put in the additional restrictions. And we can see that we have followed that trajectory for hospitalizations and we're now starting to see the decrease in census, so people in hospital with a positive COVID test, as we would expect to see because we took the measures that we did. And if we go to the next slide, our modeling then shows us that we have the ability now with the amount of immunity and the transmission patterns that we're seeing to start lifting the restrictions that we've had in place, particularly the additional ones we put in place as we are trying to understand the impact that Omicron is going to have. So our next slide, ensuring a balance and easing restrictions is the way that we have gone about this from the very beginning, using the data to make sure that we are doing um, as much as we need to do to keep things um, in, um, to, to find that balance between um, infections and opening up. So we are going to have an incremental easing of restrictions and orders starting tomorrow, and I'll give you the details of those in a minute. But that there will be some things that will remain in place, and we will are, we'll review those in detail prior to middle of March, um, prior to spring break, and again before Easter in April. We know that for some people what we're doing today will be really fast and it will make them uncomfortable. We know as well for others it's not fast enough and they would like to see things going back to as if the virus was no longer here. But the reality is that this virus continues to circulate in our community. And because we have such a high level of immunity through immunization, for most people, that doesn't lead to serious illness or hospitalizations. And we need to respect that people need to go at their own pace and businesses will need to go at their own pace, depending on their own risk. As well, our immunization campaigns will continue. As I've mentioned, we now have good data about how important that booster dose is, also for protecting against infection right now, but also for the future. In addition, um, very shortly, we should have new tools in uh, new vaccines, including the Novavax vaccine and the Metacogo vaccine, which are more traditional subunit vaccines that will be available for those people who have concerns about mRNA vaccines. And we're hoping to hear uh, news about that in the very near future. And that will be yet another option to help people get through this phase and protect us going into the future. 
So what is going to continue on our next slide? The protective measures that we have used with success here in BC that will continue for now are our mask mandate in indoor public spaces, when we have this amount of transmission in our communities and we know that those indoor spaces are where um, we can transmit more easily, that are riskier settings, that extra layer of protection becomes important. We also will continue to use the BC vaccine card as a way of ensuring that we're mitigating that risk in those highest risk indoor settings. And it will rely on the COVID safety plans with the important um, backbone of the COVID safety plans to allow people to return to offices and workplaces. And then starting on February 16th at 11.59 p.m. in the next slide, we will be uh, removing restrictions on all of the restrictions on indoor personal gatherings. And that will mean that you will make your own decisions based on your risk and the risk in your family of who you will have over into your home and to have in, uh, in vacation rentals and other properties. We are going to be uh, allowing again indoor and outdoor organized gatherings. So those are those wedding receptions and parties and celebrations up to curtail or put on hold for the last few weeks. They will be with the that, with the mask mandate and the BC vaccine card be allowed at full capacity. And because of the amount of immunity that we have and the protection that we get through those, we'll be able to go to full capacity and no longer have those requirements of remaining at tables. So that means mingling and dancing and all of those other important things that we've missed will be back. The indoor seated events will go back to full capacity. We had put in um, that 50% capacity at movie theaters and arts events and sports events. That will go back to full capacity as we were before we uh, hit this Omicron wave. Fitness centers, adult sports, dance and swimming will also go back to full capacity and we'll be removing those restrictions we had on, uh, on tournaments for adults. Um, in this now as things are, are improving and the risk is going down. And importantly, uh, in restaurants and our food and, and uh, beverage serving uh, orders, restaurants, bars and nightclubs will now be allowed to reopen and go back in terms of restaurants to full capacity with no limits of people at tables and going back to mingling and then being able to have events in restaurants and dancing. And it is because we have those, those layers of protection through the vaccine card, through our masking, and through those COVID safety plans that we can go back to full capacity in these settings again. So for most people, that will start on Thursday morning, the 17th, although um, at midnight on, the, uh, on February 16th, uh, the orders that were in place will expire. So we do have some protective measures still in place. And as I said, these will be reviewed to see if any of them or all of them are still necessary. And we're committing to reviewing them again by March 15th and letting people know where we are then based on the data and the surveillance that we have. And again, on April 12th, prior to the Easter weekend. So along with the masks and the vaccine card, um, we will be looking at the uh, increasing visitation and looking at the restrictions that we have on, on additional social visits in long-term care. We'll be working with our school and, and child care and early childhood education um, on the reviewing of the guidelines for K-12 and child care. We'll be meeting with faith leaders to review the, the, the some remaining restrictions we have in, in faith communities. And there's two orders on uh, child and youth overnight camps and uh, the industrial camps orders that we will be reviewing as well as we move through the next month. So that's where we are right now. I want to say how proud I am of people in British Columbia for stepping up and doing what you have done to take care of each other, to follow the guidance that we have. We are at an exciting and positive milestone, but we've had we have all sacrificed and come through a lot in the last two years and we want to move ahead slowly and cautiously and thoughtfully and we need to do this um, to together to make sure that we're respecting each other's comfort levels as we move into this and we build that confidence to come back together again in so many ways that we need. 
So let's this take this time to recognize our progress and all that we have done through this pandemic to turn the tide on COVID-19. Our long-term sustainable strategy about recovery, readiness and respect. It's about moving slowly and thoughtfully and gradually getting back to all of the things that we love. It means all of us continuing to be accountable to each other, managing our own risks and equally important, protecting those around us. We are on track and we are progressing well. So let's look to tomorrow with hope and know that optimism that we can increasingly start living with this virus without it disrupting so many aspects of our life. But we can't um, lose sight of the fact that we have some ways to go yet. The journey ahead will be a challenge and different for all of us. But if we continue to respect each other, to be kind to each other, we will get through this phase of it as well. Thank you, Minister. See, this is important. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Henry, and uh, good afternoon. Um, today, uh, I'll provide an update on BC's rapid test inventory, healthcare workers off sick last week, and an update on surgical postponements. First, I want to reiterate the gratitude to all British Columbians who have uh, overwhelmingly done the right thing over the past two years following public health orders and guidance, and most importantly, getting vaccinated. It's because of these efforts by all of us that we are where we are today. Regarding rapid tests, up to the end of February 11, 2020, BC has received 15,318,006 tests. Also, as of February 11, we had deployed 7,231,358 of these tests to key strategic areas. This leaves a current inventory of 8,086,648. As noted in previous weeks, 558,648 of the current inventory are not suitable for deployment for takeaway or personal use. And these tests will continue to be used at the discretion of medical health officers in the appropriate settings to manage clusters and outbreaks. That leaves 7,528,000 tests that are suitable for self-administered use. Uh, in addition, there's approximately 2,876,470 tests en route to British Columbia. And now, an additional 9,964,710 tests are scheduled to arrive over the weeks to come, but are not yet in transit. But we await the additional 9.9 .9 million tests. We will be working to deliver the approximately 10.4 million tests that have arrived or are in transit through the following allocations. 720,000 to COVID-19 test sites across BC to replenish their supply. As you know, they've already received millions. 200,000 to replenish supply at acute care centers for healthcare workers and health authority employees. 100,000 to support the testing of visitors and staff in long-term care and assisted living, in addition to the approximately 1.74 million they have already received. 300,000 to support rural, remote, and indigenous communities. 300,000 for businesses and organizations, 3.8 million more test kits to K-12 education, 2.1 million more test kits for the post-secondary education sector. These last allocations related to education mark an important shift as students will be offered in the coming weeks the opportunity to take home one five test kit for their and their family's future use if they were to become symptomatic. Assuming the in-transit delivery of 2.87 million uh, tests arrive later this week, we also anticipate starting distribution at no cost to citizens to the, broader, uh, to the broader community. We will begin with seniors, carrying on our focus on higher risk individuals, but will expand to the broader population as the inventory continues to arrive. It's important to remember, and I know Dr. Henry will remind us, that testing continues to be something we do when we have symptoms. That hasn't changed. Increased test availability means that more members of the general population will be able to access tests to use to understand their own symptoms and illness and to take action to limit transmission to their friends, family, and work. 
including those at higher risk. I'll have more to say uh, over the next week, and Dr. Henry and I will have more to say on the distribution over the next week. With respect to the impact of sickness on health care workers, we saw a decrease in the number of staff with short-term illness uh, off sick, 15,524 during the week of February 7th to 13th. By way of comparison uh, from the previous week, we had 17,158 <coughs> health care workers off sick. That's 3,438 in Fraser Health, 2,932 in Interior Health, 1,612 in Northern Health, 1,538 in the Provincial Health Services Authority, 2,181 in Vancouver Coastal Health, 3,273 in Island Health, and 550 in Providence. Particular in Interior Health, proportionately, that continues to be a significant number. And while it has come down in the last couple of weeks, it continues to be higher than it normally would be this time of year. Just to be clear, these are not, this is not illness from COVID-19 we're talking about. It's all illness, including COVID-19, in comparison to similar periods in, in previous years. It's uh, a product come down to about 20% higher. Uh, and now here's our surgical renewal update. Uh, health authorities report uh, 6,006 surgeries were completed from January 16th to 22nd. We want to talk about the most recent period from February 6th to 12th. Health authorities postponed 320 non-urgent scheduled surgeries. That's 70 in Fraser Health, 3 in Northern Health, 231 in the Interior Health Authority, 10 in Island Health, and 6 in the Provincial Health Services Authorities. No sur surgeries were postponed in Vancouver Coastal Health. All the efforts we've made to stop COVID's rapid spread from using our COVID sense to getting vaccinated to consistently following public health guidance have made a difference. Because of those efforts, where it's safe to do so, health authorities have been able to start again booking and completing surgeries that were postponed. We said patients would get calls to rebook their surgeries. They will, all of them will. And that is exactly what is starting to happen. Patients are starting to get their calls. Patients are starting to get their surgeries. There will continue to be some postponements because of staffing or the need to create capacity. But is what is vital right now is we all understand that our work is not done and you can see that it is not done. All of us need to keep making a difference that matters. And as we do this work that we do so well, we make the essential difference in the lives of all patients who are waiting for those calls and we think of them today and all of the healthcare workers who continue to do exceptional work throughout our healthcare system. And with that, I'll invite the Premier back to the podium. We're happy to take your questions. Thank you, uh, Dr. Henry, Minister Dix. And uh, I know there'll be a, a range of questions and whoever's the most appropriate person to answer them will step up and offer a solution to whatever conundrum you have before you. Thank you, Premier. As a reminder to media on the phone line, please press star one to enter the queue. You're limited to one question and one follow-up. First question today is from Richard Zussman, Global News. I look forward to solutions. Uh, many other jurisdictions in Canada, as you are acutely aware, are getting rid of vaccine cards uh, ranging from Alberta all the way to Quebec with a timeline um, largely through this month and into March. Why is British Columbia one of the outliers here in terms of keeping the vaccine card in place? Is this about science or is it about confidence slash trying to get people to still get vaccinated? Well, I believe it's a, a combination of uh, all of those uh, variables. As you know, uh, uh, the vaccine card uptake in British Columbia was swift and it was overwhelming. And uh, it gives people comfort uh, when they go out into social settings, particularly seated events, uh, that the people that are around them have taken the same measure to protect themselves. So I'll allow Dr. Henry to talk about why the science is important. But again, British Columbians have been comfortable to be outliers on a number of fronts. Uh, and we've done so because we want to ensure that the sacrifices that people have made over the past two years are not in vain. And therefore, a measured approach is how we've uh, addressed all of these issues going back to uh, 2020. And we'll continue to do that. I believe that British Columbians want us to chart a BC course based on uh, the variables that come into play in our communities, based on the, the level of acceptance of the measures 
uh, that have come forward, as, as all three of us have said repeatedly, the success of, of our uh, approach to COVID has been a direct result of British Columbians acknowledging that they can take personal actions and they can get vaccinated, they can follow public health guidelines, they can wash their hands, they can stay at home when they're sick, and most importantly, they can respect other people's comfort levels. And the immunization card has a role to play in that. I don't know if you want to add the science piece to that. So we've always had a bit of a, a, a different approach in use of the VC vaccine card. And it's for very specific settings that are the higher risk settings that are indoor settings where people often have to take their masks off for a period of time or where near in settings uh, that are indoors uh, with people that you don't know and you don't know their vaccine status. So those are um, those are important things. And what we've done is we have taken off restrictions on uh, capacity limits, for example, because we have the mitigation uh, of the, the BC vaccine card. So we're different from Ontario, from Quebec in that regard. So it has played a role. That played a role in reducing and, and not eliminating the risk of transmission. And we know, especially with Omicron, that it can still be transmitted, although that is less and particularly less in people who have their booster dose on board as well. Um, but we also know that in those indoor settings where it's applied, um, where we can have quite large numbers of people together, that even if there's some transmission, the amount of immunity from vaccination means it's not going to be spread as widely and we're not going to get people getting seriously ill and ending up in hospital at the same degree. So there are reasons that we're keeping it in place, but really it's being able to take away capacity limits and still have mitigation of risk in those settings. So we've used it somewhat differently. Having said that, uh, we'll also be reassessing uh, when its value is no longer needed. And it has to do with the amount of transmission we're seeing in our communities and where we no longer need to mitigate that risk and people are more comfortable uh, with being together in those indoor uh, discretionary settings. Richard, do you have a follow-up? I'm just wondering what enforcement tools will be in place, especially when it comes to mask wearing. We know it was already challenging at places like Canucks games. Now you add nightclubs and bars and other weddings where people are going to want to get sort of face to face. How do you enforce the mask mandate and how quickly could the province pivot back if we see a resurgence in COVID in the fall, Dr. Henry, as you have alluded to in the past, could we see these restrictions come back as respiratory season comes back next fall. Yeah, so uh, in terms of, you know, enforcement, we've also seen very much that people understand the use of masks in those settings. They feel comfortable with them. All of us have gotten used to where we wear masks. So I don't believe enforcement is going to be a large I know there are some places that are trying to make points around these things, but really, it, it, you know, people speak with their comfort level, and uh, we expect people to do that and to manage their own risk in most settings. Yeah, and uh, as I talked about, we're not out of this pandemic yet. We are very much, I believe, in a transition phase. And so much of that has to do with the amount of immunity that we have here and across the country. Um, but it's not the same everywhere around the world. So it is inevitable that we will see some waning of immunity, that we'll see new variants arise. And so what we are focused on is how do we manage this is serious respiratory illness along with influenza, along with RSV, that we expect to have impacts in our communities during the respiratory season. And I hope it will be the fall and not before that. Um, but what uh, what we need to look at is, you know, who's most at risk, who will be most at risk during that period of time, given what variants we're seeing. So we will be really focusing on our surveillance systems, on making sure we're uh, continuing our vaccine effectiveness studies, on understanding who's most at risk from whatever the next variant is that arises. But I don't believe we will have to go back to broad societal measures. Um, 
unless something dramatically different happens. We have a, a, a baseline of immunity that we know protects people from serious illness. So what we will focus on is how do we best protect those people who are most at risk? So whether it's seniors in long-term care and adding it into the measures that we take uh, around other outbreaks in long-term care homes and adjusting our communicable disease plans that we do for managing outbreaks of measles, for example, in, in schools and uh, adding COVID into those, uh, those types of, of strategies that we have going into the fall. And we'll be spending more time um, with people on how do you understand your own risk and when uh, we're seeing transmission in your community, what you do to keep yourself safe. So there's lots of things that we will do um, to support people who are more at risk of severe illness. And our hope and expectation is we won't have to have broad societal measures because we know they have health and, and well-being impacts as well. Anybody else wants to add? Question is from Bender Sajjan, CTV. Uh, hi there. Um, Dr. Henry, you heard your talk there about some public health measures that will continue for years ahead. Just wondering if you can shed some light on what those measures would be specifically. Would it be, you know, to protect those higher risk populations or, you know, are we talking about perhaps um, mouth? Yeah, no, we're talking about the basics of how we protect ourselves. And, you know, these are the things that I've said hundreds and hundreds of times, things like staying home when you're sick. But how do we facilitate that? Because we have learned that it's not that easy for many people. So things like having um, mandatory sick leave policies make a big difference in being able to support that. It means, uh, you know, washing your hands regularly, covering your mouth when you cough, wearing masks in certain situations. And that is culturally um, what's been done in, in other communities. And I think we now all have learned that. So it may be important if there's high levels of transmission in a community but it will be based on guidance and advice, not on orders, um, at least going forward. That's our expectation. So all of those important things that we do to prevent transmission of, of influenza, of other things, um, will be important. And we'll just need to reinforce those during periods of time where we see higher respiratory illness transmission. Do you have a follow-up, Binder? Yeah, just wondering, uh, when it comes to masks, um, I know some other places are uh, kind of dropping mask requirements uh, for younger kids. I'm just wondering, you know, with masks still required in indoor public places for those five plus now in BC, is there any chance we could see uh, by age group those requirements being lifted or do you envision it being all at once? And just also for the Premier, um, you're aware, of course, of the, the ongoing protests. And are you worried at all that this could make protesters think either that their actions have worked or that it could further embolden uh, other actions. Yeah, I, I hope we, we've shown that it's the actions that all of us have taken over the last um, months and, and two years now that have made a difference to getting us where we are. Um, in terms of masks, uh, it, it is that, you know, I think really important. We've talked about, I've talked about this quite a few times, you know, when you have higher rates of transmission in the community, and they're still really high right now, all the different layers become more important. As those rates go down, it becomes m less important in many different situations to have every single one of those layers. So we will be looking at, at mask wearing and where we can switch to it being that recommendation for when you're in certain settings, in certain conditions. Uh, versus having a mandate that requires it in pub public indoor spaces at all times. So that's something that we'll be reviewing in March and, uh, you know, and, and or April, depending on um, where we get to in, uh, in terms of transmission in the community by, the, by March. So with respect to the restrictions that were lifted, will be lifted tomorrow, uh, those were designed to be temporary. Those were designed to address the Omicron wave, which we had uh, little or no knowledge of when it arrived uh, in uh, December. Uh, and uh, the decision to pick this day to make this announcement, uh, Dr. Henry and Minister Dix uh, talked about this in early January. This is not uh, brought upon uh, the public today by any protest, any uh, 
uh, horn honking any uh, encampments. It was brought about because this was the plan we had when we brought in the restrictions to protect people at a time of uncertainty. You'll remember uh, at Christmas how uncertain we were. Uh, case counts were uh, spiking, hospitalizations were increasing, and we were uncertain about how we were going to be addressing yet another wave of COVID-19. But we said at the beginning these were temporary measures to protect people. Uh, we said in early January that we would revisit the question uh, just prior to the family day long weekend, and that's exactly what we've done. We have been driven from the beginning on the best available science to protect people, to keep our economy moving, and to ensure that uh, all of us got out of this together. And, and uh, poll after poll after poll for two years has demonstrated that British Columbians are comfortable with an approach that includes them, uh, which we've done with uh, faith groups. Uh, the three of us have engaged with faith leaders from a multitude of denominations for the past two years to ensure that we're trying to get the balance right so people can continue to do the things that are important to them. We've been managing sector by sector, whether it be K-12, uh, child care, uh, the construction industry, hospitality, trying to engage with people to get the best outcomes possible. And that's what we'll continue to do. It's been successful uh, to, the, uh, to the greatest degree possible possible because everyone bought into it. And that, again, is confirmed time after time. There are those that disagree. A narrow sliver of the population disagrees. And uh, as I said earlier, uh, we can disagree, but don't be disagreeable. Uh, the uh, encampments in Ottawa, the occupation of uh, our cap nation's capital is uh, disappointing to every Canadian to see uh, a cache of, of automatic weapons uh, seized at a Canadian border point is disturbing for all Canadians. And uh, I believe that uh, the vast majority want to uh, get along, respect each other, and again, uh, determine everyone's comfort level and get on with your lives. That's what uh, we all aspire to do each and every day, and that's what we're gonna continue to do here in BC. Myra Whiten, the T Tai E. Hi, thank you for taking my question. Um, I'm a bit curious about um, you noting that everyone has to go on at their own pace. Um, a lot of British Columbians I've spoken to are expressing that they feel they don't have the tools to make an accurate risk uh, decision, especially those that are immunocompromised who feel that um, even daily activities are moving at a pace that is putting them at risk without their consent or, or having another option. Are you... It, as these measures um, loosen gradually, are you planning to make rapid tests available widely to the public in the immediate future? And also, are there any plans to um, open up PCR testing eligibility back to uh, the general public, not just high-risk individuals? Yeah, so a couple of things on that. Uh, it is really important that we recognize that there are people who, even with uh, uh, vaccination, um, uh, still remain at risk. And those are people who also are at risk of many other things. And in many cases, they are uh, having to take additional precautions for themselves. And and we need to understand that. And I've talked about this quite a few times, especially since Omicron, um, how important it is for us to recognize there may be people at risk that we don't even know um, that are our colleagues at work, that are our, our friends in our social networks. And so that's why we are saying respect people's comfort levels, why we have some of those important measures in place right now, like mask wearing in certain situations, like the COVID safety plans, because we're not through a period yet where where uh, the risk is low enough. And going forward, though, we will have to think about how do we not have to put on broad restrictions on everybody so that we can be inclusive of people who have immune compromising conditions. And that will mean that it will be important in some situations that, uh, you know, mask wearing will be something that some people do on an ongoing basis. And um, you know, keeping gatherings small. If we look at uh, going, to, making that choice about going to uh, a social gathering versus um, focusing on on other settings like our work setting and our school setting. So those are personal choices that we will have to make as we understand the broader context of the, of transmission. And we're working around. Uh, with tools to help support people and how to make those decisions. And I'll be talking more about that in the next few weeks. 
Um, yes, we are, as uh, Minister Dix indicated. We're expecting quite a lot of more of the at-home rapid tests to be available in the coming weeks, and we're going to focus on making sure they're available for free to people who are in those higher risk groups, particularly by age or people who have been identified as clinically extremely vulnerable. We know that we have distribution now that's going to start it already that will be going out for children uh, through schools, so they will be more available. And people who are immune compromised or um, who are older, um, they are people that may uh, benefit from the treatments that are coming online as well. And that's where the connection to PCR testing becomes so, so important. So we will be ensuring that those people have priority access to PCR testing if they develop symptoms. And these are all things that we're, we're titrating right now as we're coming through this wave, but it'll be really important as we're going into uh, the next wave um, so that we know we have systems in place for people who are uh, clinically vulnerable to, to COVID, that they can get a test rapidly and can get access to treatment rapidly. So those are things we're working on right now. Myra, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, um, Dr. Henry, you know, over the weekend, yesterday, we saw 17 people um, pass away due to COVID um, just in that three-day period. And, you know, as Omicron continues to spread, as you're aware, about one in 10 cases conservatively end up with long-term health complications, including long COVID and other post-viral illness. Um, with the gradual easing of restrictions, how much of that long-term illness and, and death should British Columbians expect, um, you know, public health officials to accept um, as the restrictions continue to open? And is there uh, a benchmark or a, um, a figure that would give you pause uh, as you reevaluate the restrictions that are in place? Yeah, so really challenging questions. And uh, it, it, when we look at the people who have died, it is sadly overwhelmingly people who are um, uh, are seniors and elders, some of them in long-term care. And of course, we, we count everybody uh, in long-term care who dies within 30 days of a positive COVID test. So um, many people are dying with COVID, not necessarily because of it, but it is important to, to recognize that. But we are also seeing unvaccinated people in particular who don't have that degree of protection from severe illness who are dying and some of them younger in their 30s and 40s and that's important to recognize. We, we do know um, that with the, the high rates of transmission in the community, um, this small, this number of people that we're seeing could be so much worse if we didn't have that number of people protected through vaccination. I'm not being very eloquent in how I'm saying this, but it is a reminder to us that this is not an innocuous virus and it can have very severe effects, particularly in people who, who don't have a strong ability to respond, don't have a strong immune response, don't have the protection of vaccination, and even uh, for some people who are immune compromised or who are older, so we do need to continue to take measures to protect them, and that's why you're seeing the measures that we still have in place in long-term care to reduce risk and uh, the, the vaccine card, things like mask wearing and staying away if we're ill ourselves. A couple of things that we're learning about long COVID, um, people who are infected, and, and there's still a lot unknown about Omicron and long-term effects. Some people do get very sick. It's not an innocuous illness, as I've said a number of times. Um, but we do know the risk of having long-term symptoms that persist uh, when you're vaccinated is at least half. And we've seen that through other waves. It seems to hold true for Delta as well, or so for Omicron as well. So vaccination again is another thing that protects you from long COVID. Really important. We still don't have a good understanding of children and longer term impacts of this virus and infections in children. So that's an important thing that we're still trying to get information about. Um, and we'll need to monitor this over the long haul. It does remind us that we have downsides of opening up, but we also know that there's impacts, societal impacts on health and well-being and mental health from some of the restrictions that are in place. So it is finding that balance between those two. Next question is from Les Lane, Times Colonist. 
Oh, thank you. Dr. Henry, are, are um, health professionals in, in BC still under orders to get vaccinated by March 24th, or is that aspect of it under review with some of the other stuff through March and April? No, the, the health care worker immunization uh, is, is still in place, as is uh, the, the work with the colleges around uh, uh, registered health professionals. And I think it's a really important thing that we all, it's not just for getting through this wave right now, it's for that longer term protection as we learn to live with this virus over time. So it is important, it is still in place. Um, the order will be published very soon for regulated health professionals. And I will say, you know, one of the things that I was looking at very carefully with the colleges is having other options available. So I mentioned that uh, we are hopeful that we'll hear from Health Canada about two other uh, vaccines that um, will be available hopefully very shortly. Uh, the Novavax vaccine and Medicago, which um, are really important options and effective vaccines for people who uh, either can't or, or uh, aren't able to take the mRNA vaccines. Follow up, Les? Yeah, you've been quite clear that uh, we're nowhere near out of this. Uh, it's going to run for a year or more and that um, another wave, at least one, is expected. Uh, is there any, uh, you're confident of that, but you're also confident that you won't need the same level of uh, mandates and restrictions to deal with what's coming up. Is it just purely the, the, the vaccines that lead you to that confidence that you don't have to flip on some of this and go back to restrictions next fall? Um. I guess it's it's a combination of things. It's it's understanding immunity and what we're learning about it, longer term immunity and and how that is maintained even with a, a radically different um, variant of the virus uh, being Omicron. There's many things we we don't know um, whether we'll need a booster dose, uh, whether that's everybody or just people who are most at risk and people who have these stronger immune systems will be longer lasting. You know, some of the decisions we made uh, uh, quite early on in the immunization program have proved to be very um, important in longer term protection, that interval between dose one and dose two. And now the interval between dose two and the booster dose is has uh, shown to be really important. But there's lots of things we don't yet know that I'm spending quite a lot of time looking into and with uh, with my colleagues, things like, uh, you know, the nasal spray vaccines that are under development. Could that be uh, an option as a booster dose to help um, uh, stimulate our mucosal immunity in the nose and the back of the throat? You know, that's where Omicron has been attacking, attacking for example. Um, and does that uh, lead to a strong enough boost of uh, the cell mediated immunity so there's many things that we don't yet know but we do we can see that it is that high level of vaccination that has allowed us to weather this omicron wave and we did put in some restrictions but we didn't have to do things like lockdowns and other things because we had that high level of immunity and we layered on some of the other measures um, in, in certain settings as well. And that, that made a difference. We also need to really, um, we, we've understood and we've come to see how fragile our health care system is. And I know the minister is working very hard on that to make sure that we have that capacity to, to be able to care for people with a, a surge that is inevitable to come. But, but I do believe, knowing what I know about um, pandemics and how we've weathered them and all of the scenarios that we have seen over the last two years, that we will see sort of an oscillating. And yes, there will be, uh, there will be waves and troughs of, of COVID. It's uh, likely to have different impacts in different years, depending on how much the virus changes over time. Rob Buffum, CTV, Vancouver Island. Rob, are you on mute? Okay, we are moving on to our last question. Mira Baines, CBC. Okay, so I'm, I'm hoping to get answers in English and in French. 
Um, Dr. Henry, you're indicating that the current safety rules for the K-12 system will be reviewed in March and April. But how likely is it that those restrictions will be lifted by the end of the school year? There are parents uh, in BC who say they've never been inside the, the school their child attends uh, to volunteer, to meet a teacher, or uh, go watch an event. Yeah, so I... I, um, I I can tell you that um, there's likely to be some changes sooner rather than later. And we've been working with my team at the BCCDC have been working with the K-12 Steering Committee and at looking at exactly this, you know, how do we make it as, as normal as possible and experience. We recognize that that's so important for growth and development, especially for younger children. And now that we have vaccination available to all school age children, the risk profile changes. And we've learned from Omicron, there's no such thing as zero risk in a school setting, in any setting, really. So it's about how do we manage it in a way that allows for full participation in school activities without some of those restrictions. Um, I know that they are working right now on uh, things like spectators at sports, and we'll be hearing more from the Education Committee and the Education Minister around that very soon. So these are all questions that I don't have answers for you yet, but that we are looking at how do we make sure that the K-12 experience um, aligns with what we're seeing in the community and uh, is, a, is the best that we can do for, for kids. I will also say, because I'm started to get questions already, that we, we are very aware that uh, graduation will be coming up in a few months and how can we make that, um, again, aligned with what we're seeing in risk in the community and, and a, a more normal experience for, for grads this year, too. Quand même, on a pris pas mal de décisions aujourd'hui, mais euh, il faut euh, vivre, je pense, dans le présent, c'est-à-dire de, de suivre des mesures et des conseils qui sont en place pour réduire, euh, réduire la transmission de COVID-19, pour, pour protéger des gens. Uh, la secteur d'éducation va travailler avec la santé publique sur ces questions dans les semaines et les mois à venir et uh, vont prendre, je pense, les décisions à, à le bon moment. En, en même temps, eh, pendant les, les quelques semaines à venir, on va distribuer à peu près 5,8 millions de tests rapides un peu partout dans le système d'éducation, que ce soit de kindergarten au deuxième, deuxième année. Uh, ou uh, 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 aux universités et aux collèges. Donc, on va le faire aussi pour augmenter uh, les protections pour tout le monde. Donc, uh, ce travail continue, mais il faut vivre dans le présent, n'est-ce pas? Et nous allons travailler ensemble avec des gens dans le secteur uh, pour assurer peut-être des changements uh, au, au futur, mais pas aujourd'hui. Mira, do you have a follow-up? Yes, and uh, again in English and in French. Uh, Dr. Henry, at this point, 55% of kids 5 to 11 in BC have received one dose of a COVID uh, vaccine. Is that number an acceptable level for you? And what, if anything, is being done to try to get that percentage up? And will it be necessary to make sure more kids get vaccinated? Yeah, no, uh, obviously that's not an accept acceptable level. Um, we do really want to protect young children. As I mentioned, we still don't have a lot of insight into the long-term impacts on younger children uh, from infection, even though it does thankfully seem to be re relatively mild in younger kids. Um, so it, it is important. We do know um, that vaccination is safe in that age group. The, uh, uh, the pediatric formula formulation is working well. Um, lots of kids are now getting dose two. Um, and that's important. It's important to help get back to those normal activities um, as we're still seeing transmission and to to normalize things for, for young uh, kids in schools as well as their social connections. So we are doing quite a few things. It's very community dependent. As the, the booster doses have decreased and we're making sure that the pharmacies are ramping up to be able to provide booster doses for adults and older children, um, we're looking at more targeted uh, clinics for, for younger children where they can have all of their questions answered. and. 
I really do want to encourage parents. We, we know lots now about the safety of these pediatric vaccines and how well they work. And talk to your health care provider, talk to your pediatrician, your pharmacist, um, your public health nurse. Answer, get your questions answered. And it's very important to protect our youngest kids as well. And just to say there are appointments available today at the Get Vaccinated website or call 1-833-838-2323 and get your appointment today because um, this is an example, 93.5% I believe of adults have received their first dose immunization against COVID-19, 93.5%. Well, we think 6.5% unvaccinated is too high. And why do we think that? Because you're 30 times as likely. 30 times, 3-0 is likely to get into crit, to be in critical care if you're not vaccinated. So, c'est le moment d'être vacciné. Et je pense que les 55% qui sont déjà vaccinés entre 5, à 5, de 5 à 11 ans sont un nombre important. Mais il faut toujours y travailler. Je pense qu'aussi, il y a beaucoup de gens maintenant dans des dizaines de milliers qui ont reçu la deuxième dose de 5 à 11 ans. Mais il faut continuer cet effort et on va euh, nous efforcer de communiquer surtout avec des parents pour assurer que la, autant que possible sont vaccinés parce que c'est une façon pour protéger euh, des écoles, bien entendu, mais aussi euh, la communauté, les grands-parents, etc. Donc on va continuer ces efforts. Euh, il y a, quand il y en a 55, on va être, elle est à 56 et puis autant de suite et mais même quand on est à 93, on va être à 94 et 95. Donc on va continuer ce travail parce que c'est tellement important. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, merci beaucoup. We'll see you soon.